Hello team and welcome back to One on One, the most in-depth football show on YouTube. Today we're going to be talking about money, power and statistical analysis. It's going to be like Scarface for nerds. This includes Liverpool's potential new power player, a brief history of why the Premier League has been so resistant to data analysts, how that could change in the coming years and the club in the Netherlands that's already paving the way. I'm calling this part one of my stats odyssey. There it is. And if this video hits 3k likes, I'll drop a part two, not just as a next episode, but as an extra upload. So let's have at it, you dirty dogs. Part one, the magic bean. In early October of 2020, it was reported that Billy Bean could become part of the ownership group of Premier League champions, Liverpool. But who is he? Bean helped ignite the data revolution in American sports and currently runs the front office of Major League Baseball side, the Oakland A's. His Moneyball philosophy has helped the A's, might want to reconsider that nickname, beat higher spending rivals in the MLB by using detailed statistical analysis to identify undervalued players. Author and financial journalist Michael Lewis scribed a book on his methods in 2003 which was then turned into the popular film Moneyball in 2011, featuring Brad Pitt. As detailed in the film, John Henry, Liverpool's billionaire owner, has been in hot pursuit of Bean for nearly two decades, unsuccessfully trying to lure him to the Boston Red Sox as general manager. Now, with Henry's Fenway Sports Group looking to merge with Red Ball Acquisition Group, a company founded and co-chaired by Bean, it looks like he may have finally got his man. It's the sporting equivalent of a sperm whale eating a giant squid. Which does happen, and it is disgusting. To facilitate the deal, Henry is prepared to offer Red Ball a less than 25% stake in FSG, taking the company public in the process. Now, if all goes according to plan, that values Fenway Sports Group at roughly 8 billion dollars. City Football Group is currently the world's most valuable sporting franchise and it's worth roughly half that. It would also likely see Bean take charge of European football operations, not baseball, like many first predicted. As a minority shareholder in the A's, he can't have financial interest in more than one MLB club. Admittedly, talks are at an early stage and could still fall apart. However, even if the move doesn't go through, this represents a fascinating cultural shift at the top echelon of the Premier League. Would a former baseballer turned analyst running the number one club in the world's richest football league signal the beginning of the end for football's old school ways? Quite possibly. Part two, late to the numbers game. While the use of sophisticated analytics in baseball stretches back over 70 years, it's still somewhat of a novelty in European football. After all, it was only in 2014 that The Guardian proclaimed, there has been a revolution in football though it is one that even the most committed fans will only be dimly aware of. This, of course, referred to the use of statistical analysis becoming commonplace rather than the exception. So why is it taking so long for big data to become an accepted part of the beautiful game? Here's my very brief explanation. A. Football is a much more fluid and unpredictable game than baseball, for example, so is therefore harder to apply mathematical models to. B. Football is also extremely conservative and change-averse, particularly in England. Now, we've only got a limited amount of time, so let's open up on point B, which is much more interesting. In mid-2018, a study by Spanish paper Marca found that the average age of managers in the Premier League was higher than that of the other four leading divisions. This was especially pronounced when comparing it to the Bundesliga, where the average head coach was eight years younger than their Premier League counterpart. Couple this with the fact there's only two owners under the age of 50 in the English top flight, and a very clear picture begins to present itself. The old guard are still making the most important decisions. Of course, it would be hugely reductive of me to say that people of a certain age are automatically stats averse. Bean, for example, is in his late 50s. However, when the powers that be afford people power, it's very rarely the data analyst. In this sense, we can hold up English football's unwillingness to dilute the role of manager as its ultimate form of conservatism. Let's take a look at a few examples. The old school butting heads with the new school is probably best encapsulated by the career of former Arsenal scout Damien Kamali. In 2005, he was hired as Tottenham Hotspur's head of football operations credited with bringing in the likes of Dimitar Berbatov and Luka Modric. Then, in 2008, with Juan de Ramos's side performing poorly, he was given the boot. Ramos's replacement, Harry Redknapp, apparently insisted that Kamali's position be abolished. 
the club concurred. In 2010, after a controversial spell at St Etienne, Kamali took up the role of Director of Football Strategy at Liverpool. At the Reds, the Frenchman splashed out in the 2011-12 season to acquire the likes of Jordan Henderson and Stuart Downing using their final third regain percentages as justification for their lofty fees. However, after a poor run of results, it was Kamali that departed in 2012, reportedly spurned by the Liverpool hierarchy for wasting money. Club legend Kenny Dalglish, who was managing the club at the time, escaped the same fate. Now, while not entirely conclusive, it is pretty fascinating that two top clubs in times of turmoil chose to give their manager or incoming manager more power and do away with the role of director of football. Of course, it could just be that Kamal is really difficult to work with. This isn't exactly extensive. However, it did take Liverpool another six years before they hired their next sporting director. A more recent example of the fractious nature between the old guard and the new numbers men includes Sven Mislintat's miserable reign while at Arsenal. When the former head of recruitment left the club under a cloud in 2019, he labelled the Gunners dysfunctional and a mess. Mislintat had been brought in to revolutionise the club's recruitment policy, but instead found his department and his role increasingly marginalised. He told the Independent, the new leadership work more strongly with what they are offered from clubs or agents through their own networks. The Swedes cited Unai Emery's decision to bring in Dennis Suarez on loan instead of promoting from within as the final straw. He left and was swiftly replaced by former player Edu. Once again, we can put this forward as a club returning to what it knew in the face of a crisis. My favourite anecdote though that perfectly illustrates the conflict between the more conservative quarters of football and the new wave of analysts has to come from Harry Redknapp. When he was manager of Southampton, he turned to one of his analysts and said, I'll tell you what, next week, why don't we get your computer to play against their computer and see who wins? I'm pretty sure this was Redknapp's way of saying that, you know what, I'm not entirely sure that these two worlds coexist. Of course, there's been some well-publicised, high-profile success stories too. The analysts at Manchester City had much more luck when it came to convincing Roberto Mancini to heed their advice. Despite initial resistance, they were able to convince the Italian that in-swinging corners were more dangerous than out-swinging corners, which were his preference at the time. When City won the title in 11-12, they scored 15 goals from corners, more than any other Premier League side. One of these goals was that Vincent Company header against Manchester United, which effectively sealed the deal. Should Bean take charge at Liverpool, you'd imagine the club would become much more resistant to the temptation of reverting to old ways, even when times are tough. As general manager of the Oakland days, he once said, the idea that I should trust my eyes more than the stats, I don't buy because I've seen magicians pull rabbits out of hats and I know the rabbit's not in there. But is there any evidence that his methods can be transferred over to football or will he become just another well-intentioned disappearing act like Damien Kamali? Part 3. AZ Alkmaar Bean is apparently infatuated with the English game. He's gone on record to say that he regularly gets up at 5am to watch his beloved Arsenal and has also spent time with some of the best thinkers that football has to offer, including Sir Alex Ferguson and Arsene Wenger. However, his football apprenticeship has mostly been served on the continent. This is despite leading a consortium to buy Barnsley in 2017, but that's a story for a different time. It's been reported that one of the nations that's intrigued Bean most from a football sense is the Netherlands because of their ability to compete at major international tournaments despite only having a population of 17 million. So when his role as an advisor to AZ Alkmaar was announced in 2015, it made perfect sense. This was especially as the club had been receptive to a data-led approach before. Louis van Gaal, who was the last Alkmaar manager to lead them to a top flight title, was always very vocal in his support of a stats-based approach, even when it wasn't exactly in vogue. Nowadays, that stance is shared at boardroom level. Alkmaar's executive director, Robert Einhorn, is a former New York Yankee and was highly influential in bringing Bean to the club. Since then, the working relationship has blossomed, including an unlikely title charge in 1920, before the season was curtailed by COVID. As such, Bean was invited to become a minority shareholder in the club in early 2020, with Einhorn stating, Over the past five years, Billy's advisory role has brought AZ many advantages. 
and working with him, we've got to know how wonderful it is to have his breadth and depth of knowledge at our disposal. Bean has since played down his influence, crediting AZ's collaborative approach. It's fun to see a club like that have success with a similar type of business plan that all of us have carried out here with the A's. They're a great group of guys, and I'm tickled they've had the success and that I could be a part of it. So, where exactly was Bean's expertise utilised in this whole scenario? Well, dear viewer, that sort of information not readily available, so I've had to do a bit of creative digging of my own. The first area that I chose to analyse was AZ's success from dead ball situations, predominantly free kicks. This is where football most resembles baseball, and because of a start lack of imagination, conversion rates are traditionally very low. So the starting point down here. In 2015-16, the season that Bean came to the club, AZ scored 11 set pieces in 38 matches, ranking them 10th in the league. By 1920, however, they had scored 12 in just 25 matches, ranking first, seven ahead of Ajax and five ahead of PSV. My next port of call was a cursory look at the top line numbers. Their shots conceded in this five-year window also improved exponentially, from a middling seventh best to second best in the Eredivisie. Their shots taken never dropped below fifth. Now, it would be extremely reductive to say that Bean was a key component in all of these positive trends. However, what we can deduce is that by being markedly better at set pieces, AZ haven't had to overperform in attack in order to improve their league ranking. As such, there's been no wild pursuit of forward talent, nor have they allowed sentiment to dictate when they sell players, happily releasing them as soon as their evaluation is met. Even when Vincent Janssen scored 27 goals in 15-16, the club had no reservations about selling him. It would have been easy to keep hold of him, particularly when he scored three goals in his first four international appearances. The hyperbole around him was massive. However, a season after securing his services for just 450k, Bean told the club to accept any offers of over 16.5 million pounds. Janssen eventually went to Spurs for 19 million pounds, where he scored two goals in 31 Premier League appearances. Bean and the powers that be at AZ had worked out that the striker had probably overperformed and chose to capitalise on it. It was also the club's first eight-figure departure, something they've replicated three times in the subsequent four windows. Now, it's unclear how central a figure Bean was in these negotiations. However, it's fairly obvious that during his time at the club, AZ have got a hell of a lot better at evaluating their own talent. Rather than being slaves to A, the market rates, or B, emotion, they have clearly been pricing their assets in a way that's proportional to their influence on the team. With several of Liverpool's most influential players approaching 30, maybe Bean's big role at Liverpool will be to construct their next great side totally devoid of emotion. Conclusion Now, stats shouldn't be used to dismiss or replace intuition rather reinforce it or question it in a healthy manner. If they can be used to ensure that people's efforts, whether individually or collectively, align with the sporting institution or club's broader objectives, that can only be a good thing. Plus, given the amount of money in the game now, it seems pretty futile entrusting it with a manager or a sole arbitrator when, statistically, they last less than a year in the job. As the sport grows, so does the demand on those in charge. English football can no longer afford to be a one-man show. Can Billy Bean be the guy to bring around that change? Only time will tell. That's one-on-one -on -one for another week, guys. Let me know what you thought in the comments below. What would you like to see me do next? Remember to like this video, subscribe to Eurofootball Daily, and I'll see you in a few weeks. Bye.